Hello and welcome to today's video. We're going to talk about combinations and permutations and do some practice with them. So as you know, permutations are all possible arrangements of a collection of things where order is important and where the difference is that with per combinations, the order doesn't matter. We're just figuring out how many groups can we get the, these items into. So there's two types of permutations and two types of combinations. The first one is with repetition, and this is when you can repeat the same number or object again and again. Common example is a combination lock where you can have one, 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 one. And the formula for that is we just do n raised to the power of r because we have, we're choosing r of something that has n different possibilities. So we're gonna multiply n by itself r times. So now let's look at the next one, permutations without repetition. These are when you obviously can't repeat the numbers, and this is people running a race, like how many different types, how many ways can I have a top three finish, things like that. And we say that it is n factorial divided by n minus r factorial. And logically that makes sense. Um, in examples you can see why that formula works. And then now quickly we'll touch on combinations. Like we said, this is where order does matter, or doesn't matter because we're just figuring out how many groups we can get. We're figuring out how many ways can we organize these groups of people. So the types of combinations, we have repetition is allowed. And this is when you can have multiples of the same object within a group. This would be like ice cream cones, but where you can have two of one flavor and one of another, or like um, three of one flavor and zero of another. And the formula for that is R plus N minus one, choose R. And we did, we kind of uh, made that formula and figured out why it works in the last video. Then last we have repetition is not allowed. These are the common types of combinations. This is the one you really see a lot. And that's just n choose r is how we pronounce it. And it's n divided by n minus r factorial times r factorial. So these are just some formulas that you need to memorize. Hopefully you're kind of comfortable with what these are by now. So now we're going to do just some practice problems and see if you understand these better. How many arrangements of the word active are there if c and e must always be next to each other? So when I get to a problem like this, I first ask myself, okay, is this a permutation or a combination? And the way we determine that is we ask ourselves, does order matter or does order not matter? And well, I'm trying to figure out how many ways I can arrange these letters. And if order didn't matter, that would mean that I could arrange them in any way, but it would still be the same as active. So clearly order does matter in this case, because let me show you, if I have active, actually, if I can spell active, active, okay. And then I have, um, let's just do active and then switch out, switch around these letters. So V I E, we're saying these are two different um, examples. And if this was a combination, these would be seen as the same, but we're saying these are not equal. So that means we have a permutation. So we're doing a permutation. Okay. So now the question is, if I'm doing a permutation, I have a question now, Does can I do repetition or can I not do repetition? And in this case, I can't do repetition, right? Because that would be like repeating, let me saying like A, 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 A is a, an example of this. But if we're using the uh, letters in the word active, we can only use each letter one time. So repetition is not allowed. So that means I'm going to the second formula, which says P of NR equals N factorial divided by N minus R factorial. And remember, the N is how many objects we have and the R is how many we are choosing. And you're gonna notice if we're choosing the arrangements of the word active, and we're gonna use all the letters. So R is gonna equal N, and how many letters do we have? You may be tempted to say six, but there's actually just five. And the reason, well, there's five in this situ situation because C and E must always be together. So you treat C and E as one letter. So it's A, T, I, V, and then C, E. These are always going to be together, so you treat them as one group. So we're choosing from five, and then it's five minus five factorial, so it's five factorial on the top. And that gives you, on the bottom we get zero factorial, and if you remember, zero factorial equals one, so it's five factorial divided by one, which is five factorial. So that's the way that if you're really formula driven, that's the way you would do it. But what I personally want you to be able to think of is just take the problem, dissect it, and you make up your own formula because that's what you really need to be able to do for these problems. So what we did here is we showed you how you could um, think of it and get it into that, those basic formulas that we talked about. This is what I would like you to do. I would like you to read the problem and not think about permutations or combinations. Just think about what's happening. So I want you to look at this here. We have our five letters basically. 
And okay, so let's draw five more lines and think that we are trying to make as many combinations as we could of this, as many groupings, arrangements as we could. Well, for the first letter, I'm choosing between five letters, right? I can choose any of these groups. The second one, I can only do four because I can't repeat the letter I always use. So if I used A here, I couldn't use A again. If I used I, I couldn't use I again, so on. Or the CE, I couldn't use CE again. And then so you're just going to go down by one every time. So four times five, five times four times three times two times one. And you'll notice that that equals five factorial. So I would say, okay, five factorial, I'm good to go. So that's the way I would personally do it. I don't know if it's necessarily the best idea to always try to get it into one of these basic formulas, but that's something you can do if that's, if that's kind of how you learn math. So let's look at another one. How many ways can we arrange eight people around a circular table? And this is why I'm thinking of when I really say that it's good to be creative, because now we need to think, okay, what, what is this really asking? So let's think about a table normally. What if this was a regular table and it was just how many ways can I organize eight people? Well, that's pretty easy, right? So it's really eight factorial, because like we just did, we said, well, the first person can sit in eight different spots, but then the second only has seven to choose from, then six, then five, then four, then three, then two, then one. So it's eight factorial ways that I could organize these people if they were in a line. But we, they're not in a line, they're in a circular table. So let's say we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. These were the order of people that we had. We said that we, there's eight factorial ways I could organize them in any order. But the thing is, with you, when you have a circular table, if I moved everyone one seat over, you need to realize that that would be the same thing. Because it doesn't matter what seat we're in, we're looking for the arrangements. So an arrangement of um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, in that order, if I just move the seats all over one, is still the same arrangement. Everyone's still sitting next to the same person. So what you need to ask is, well, how many different spots could I put person number one? And there's eight different spots. So it's eight factorial divided by eight. That's, what, that's the effect of the circular table. And notice that that is actually seven factorial. So that's one way to think about it. Another one is you can think about this first position as kind of like an anchor position where that stays the same all the time. And then you kind of just have seven other seats to choose from and that would be seven factorial. So there's a few different ways you could think about it. I think the best way is to just think, start with just organizing people in a line and then try to think, okay, what do I, what do I need to change because it's a circular table? And you just need to think, well, everyone could just move over one seat. They would be in the same order. The, the arrangement would still be the same. So it's going to be seven factorial. And again, that's just being kind of creative almost with this and noticing how can I kind of modify a formula to make this problem work. Okay, so next one. A coat hanger has four knobs, and each knob can, knob can be painted any color. If six colors of paint are available, how many ways can the knobs be painted? So is this a permutation or a combination? Well, it's got four knobs. Each knob can be painted any color. Six colors are available. Well, I notice I can repeat any of the six colors. It doesn't say that I can't. So this is going to be one with repetition. I, I don't need to change. And then I have four knobs. Well, how many different ways can I do this? I'm going to draw my four knobs here basically as lines. How many ways can I call the first knob? Six. Second knob, six, so on and so forth. There's six ways for me to do each knob. That's six to the fourth because I'm going to multiply these together. That's how many different ways I could color the knobs. I could have one blue, one green, one blue again, and one yellow, for example. That's what we're saying here. There's six, six to the fourth ways. And if you notice, that's a permutation with repetition formula. It's n to the r, where n is the number of options we have, six, and r is the number of times we are kind of going through the motions, and we're doing that four times for the four knobs. So six to the fourth ways. So these examples weren't anything too difficult. We're going to get into harder ones later on, but hopefully this kind of makes sense, and hopefully you're getting a little bit more comfortable with the counting. And really I want you to know that it's not necessarily the best strategy to try to get into one of these basic formulas every time. You really got to be creative. Okay, so if you have any questions, let me know, and we'll get into some harder practice in the next few videos. Thanks for watching.